I find it hard to believe, but there are some people who don't like leftovers. Now, maybe you're one of them. That's okay. I have a solution. You can bring your leftovers to my house. That would be fine. We've all, we all were raised probably in a situation where sometime in your young life, your parents said, but there are starving children in some far off place who would love to have that food that you don't want to eat right now. We've all been there. But I like leftovers. In fact, if you're like me, there are some things that taste better as leftovers. I know that's hard to believe, especially those you don't like them, because you've never tried it. If it's not fresh made, you're going, I'm not going to try it. But I'm going to tell you something. If you let spaghetti be recooked about three times, <laughs> that sauce is outstanding. Now, that's just how it is. And there are some people going, I know, I get it. If it weren't for leftovers, I'd have to do a lot of cooking for myself because my wife makes these meals and then I eat on them and then I eat on them and I get really upset when my kids come by and eat it all up because the leftovers are gone but I love them. But when it comes to God, God won't take them. God does not want leftovers. God is not a God of leftovers. And yet we are people sometimes in our lives or certainly we see it around us. We know people, maybe we are people, who create a religion of leftovers. Turn, if you will, to that text in Isaiah 44 for just a moment. And I want you to see with me what the prophet says to these people. I think he's talking about a religion of leftovers. Now, if you read the rest of the chapter, you're going to find that he begins talking about idolatry. I want you to hold on to that word for just a little bit, the word idolatry. Because I'm going to suggest to you that idolatry is the religion of leftovers. I'm going to say it again. Idolatry is the religion of leftovers. Now, I'm going to expect that all of us will be able to arrive at a conclusion in a few moments that might just scare us. But I hope you get there. Number one, I want you to notice, this is serious business. In the passage read just a moment ago, God said to his people, I am the first and last, verse 6. Beside me there is no God. This is serious now. We're talking about one's understanding of who God is and what God expects. And God says, there is no other God. I am the only one. Verse 7. If you think there is another one, then I call it forth. Bring it out. Declare it. Tell me, where is this other God? Notice in the end of verse 7, he says, Can this other God tell you about things that are coming and they happen? I can. I know. And then he says in verse 8, And you are my witnesses. These people to whom he was writing, God said, You're my witnesses. You know I'm telling you the truth. I am the one who has told you what's going to happen, and it has over and over in your history, and it's happening again right in front of their eyes, penalized in Babylon for falling away from God. 
This is serious business. Number two, idolatry is senseless business. Later on today, you might want to go back and read starting in verse 9 through verse 17. If you've never read this passage, it, it really is funny. God talks about the senselessness of idolatry. And he helps us to understand that when you start practicing idolatry, you have lost your mind. That's what he says. For instance, who makes an image never to profit from it? Verse 9. Nobody. Would anybody spend time making an image and then make nothing from it? I mean, if that's your business, if you're into the business of making things to make a profit, will you make it and know it's not going to sell? It's not going to make a profit. You're just going to spend all this money and all this effort and all this time, and you're going to make all these things, and yet you get nothing back. Nobody would do that. You won't invest that kind of time and energy starting in verse 12 or in verse 12. What does a blacksmith do? Why, he spends his time really trying to make this image, but he still gets tired and he still gets hungry. You're going to spend that kind of time and make an image and receive nothing back? Nobody's going to buy it? Nobody's going to give you anything for it? Verse 13, then you have the craftsman. This is where the text starts to getting really good. I mean, the craftsman pulls out all of his tools and he measures and he cuts and he makes this image. He goes out and he gets the fine cedars, verse 14, and the cypress and the oak trees. And he starts to make all of these things. Look at verse 15. Some of it this wood that he cut to make an image, some of it, he'll warm himself. And he'll bake bread. But then he takes some of it and he bows down to it and says, you are my God. Again, he reminds us, verse 16, He burns half of it in the fire, and with the other half, he eats meat that he has cooked. He roasts. He's satisfied. He warms himself, and he has light for his house, and he says, this is what he does, but he takes the rest of it, and he makes a carved image. Notice, he takes the rest of it. He takes the leftovers, and he makes an image. He falls down before it, he worships it, he prays to it, he says, deliver me, you are my God. How senseless business is that? But it's also scary. Because according to verses 18 through 20, this kind of attitude, this this move into idolatry is deceptive. And it is so deceptive that it will ensnare you. Look at some words that he says. They do not know. They do not understand. They've shut their eyes. They cannot see and their hearts that they cannot understand. No one considers. There is no knowledge to say. I burned half of it in the fire. Yes, I've also baked bread on its coals. I've roasted meat and eaten it. Shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? You don't even understand what you're doing. You just made your meal, heated your house, lighted your house from a pile of wood, the other half of which you made an image, God, 
you bowed down and said, you are my God. And because of that, you actually think it is. We can sit here this morning smugly in this fine place because after all, we don't practice idolatry. I don't have an image in my house that I fall down to. You probably did not work like a craftsman this morning or this weekend and build an idol and before you left home, you bowed down and said, while eating food from the other half of the wood cooked that used to cook it, you are my God. And so we smugly can say, that's not me. Not true. Did you notice what he said? Where did that idol come from? The leftovers. You know what? When I give God the leftovers today, I am recreating those idolatrous images and I become an idol worshiper. Now back off. I'm not an idol worshiper. It's not what the text says. That's not the idea behind the passage. Because any time that I'm giving God the leftovers, this passage seems to indicate to me that I am on the path of idolatry. Let's notice that for a minute. What does a religion of leftovers look like? If I'm talking about a religion of leftovers, and if God is not a God who will take leftovers, and yet sometimes we give them to him, what does it look like when we do it? Number one, a religion of leftovers is built on a second-hand faith. A second-hand faith. Now, a faith that is passed down from generation to generation to generation is a desirable thing. When Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 in verse 5, he said, When I call to remembrance the sincere faith that dwelt in you, that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Why in that third generation did Timothy have faith? Because the two previous ones passed it down to him. That's a good thing. A passed down, handed down faith is a good thing. But a second hand faith is a dangerous thing. Philippians 2 verse 12. Paul made an interesting statement. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What does that mean? Here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean you get to decide for yourself how you're going to be saved. That's God's prerogative. So if that's not what it means, if I'm supposed to work out my own salvation, what is he saying? He's saying this. You make your salvation personal. Don't you rely on a second-hand faith. Don't you say, I'm okay because my mom is okay. Don't you say everything's fine with me spiritually because my dad was okay or my grandparents were okay or because, don't do that. That faith has to be yours. We have to take it with us. Parents, 
elders, preachers, Bible class teachers, great spiritual friends will not always be there. And a secondhand faith would require that the people who possess the firsthand faith be right there with you in order for it to work. When I have a secondhand faith that is not based upon me and what I am working out in my own life, then I have begun down the road of a religion of leftovers. And God won't take it. Number two, a religion of leftovers looks like this. A religion of leftovers offers second-rate gifts. Second-rate. God has never accepted second-rate gifts. When he gave the law, in Exodus chapter 13, in verse 3, before he even started giving the description of the Mosaic law, as he brought them before, in fact, he brought them out of Egypt, he said, Consecrate to me all the firstborn of Israel. Whatever opens the womb, both of man and beast, they are mine. When he established the law and he set up the Levites, he said in chapter 13 of the book of Numbers, or chapter 3, that is, in verse 13, you see, I have taken to myself the Levites from all the children of Israel in place of all the firstborn of Israel who opened the womb. For all the firstborn are mine. On the day that I struck the firstborn in Egypt, I consecrated to myself all the firstborn of Israel, both man and beast. God said, first things belong to me. Always. The first city they conquered in the land, in the land of, of the promise, Jericho. He said, you can't have anything. No gold, no silver, no dress, nothing. It's all mine. Why? First city. God said, I get the first. That's not just Old Testament. Jesus said in Matthew 6 and verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Luke 14 I tell you, except a man come to me and hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. In other words, first is God. But a religion of leftovers presents second-rate gifts, not first. For instance... When I buy everything I want, accumulate all my bills, pad my life physically with everything that I want, think I need, and that makes me happy first. And then with whatever is left over, I decide to give some money to God. That's a religion of leftovers. When I fill up my schedule in a week with everything that I want to do, all the places I want to go, everything I want to see, and then with whatever time is left over, I say, God, I'll find something for you to do with this. It's a religion of leftovers.
when I'm in a pinch and I need to find some money or some time because of whatever reason. And my first thought is, I'll decrease the money I give to the Lord, the time I give to the Lord, my talents that I give to the Lord. I'll decrease from that because I'm needing something right now. That's a religion of leftovers. And God won't take it. Third, a religion of leftovers is built on second tier knowledge. To Timothy, Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Here's what Paul was saying to Timothy. You get in the word. You study the word. And let the word cause you to be diligent in your being approved before God. That's your job. That's my job. We have a responsibility to know God through his word. But do you know what second tier knowledge is? I often give fair warning before saying things like this. Most likely there's nobody here or hardly anybody wearing steel-toed boots today. So I give you fair warning. You better be ready to pull them back because they're about to get stomped. If the only Bible study and the only searching that you do in your life is at this time in this assembly or in a Bible class organized here, that is second tier knowledge. And God will not respond positively to it when that's all there is. If the only way that you're getting to know God is by assembling on a Sunday morning, or by coming to a Bible class, if that's the only way you're getting to know God and his word, then you are in a religion of leftovers. And he won't take it. You remember that conclusion I said we're going to come to? Here we are. Those people practiced an idolatry of a literal image that stood in front of them and they bowed down to it. But our religion of leftovers does the exact same thing. It's not an image, but it's a bank account that we bow down to. It's not a statue, but it's the calendar that I make for myself to do anything I want to do that I bow down to. It's not something that I have crafted by my own hands, but it is the talents, it are the talents that I have that I use only for myself that I'm bowing down to. Because selfishness is where the religion of leftovers begins. And by another name, it is called idolatry. So you see, we can, as people of God, in 2015, be guilty of idolatry because our religion of leftovers creates the exact idolatrous situation that God was talking about in Isaiah. We better be aware. 
we better be careful. We better examine ourselves to make sure that God doesn't get just the leftovers, but that he gets prime position because that's all he's going to take. In closing, any who practice a religion of leftovers will probably find that when the faithful have gone home, they will be left over. The description of the final day in Matthew 24 at the end of that chapter says, one will be taken, another left. The righteous will be taken to the Lord. But the left, the ones who are left, practiced a religion of leftovers. So they're actually getting what they practiced. Today, God calls us to faithfulness. He calls us to commitment. He calls us to put him first. Today, if you need to be a child of God, showing your commitment in baptism to have sin removed so that you can be on his team. Today, we're here for you, or we can pray for you in any way that you need while we stand and sing together.